let's uh, get this show on the road. Hello, everyone. Hope you're well. Welcome to another edition of Math 1207 Calculus 2. Hope you still have some people trickling in here. Hopefully you guys had a good week. Um, let's finish off strong. Let's hope we can actually get through um, trig sub t. So we'll see how far we get with that. Um, People still coming in. All right, let me share my notebook screen. Okay, there we go. Let's make sure that I can see the chat. Organize things on the screen here. Okay, all right, boom, let's get into it. So uh, this is where we actually stopped last time. So just make a note, uh, boom, started here on, today's the 17th, 9, 17. All right, quick recap. So in this section, we're looking at trig integrals. It's pretty much, we're learning how to compute antiderivatives of functions involving trig functions or purely trig functions, okay? Basic premise, use trig identities to help us out. So we see an integral with some trig functions in there. We're pretty much going to use uh, some trig identity, which might be very convenient at the time to try to figure out what the integral is. So in this first example, tangent squared, right? Secant squared minus one, and we're cool. Um, then we started looking at certain products of trig functions. So products of sines and cosines and products of secants and tangents. And we went over some principles for that. Basically, you have sine and cosine. Um, whichever one has the odd power, you want to save a factor of that guy, change the other trig function to that one using the Pythagorean identities. If both of them have odd powers, you save a factor of the smaller one and then change uh, everything so that's your du. And yes, so we did all that. Then we moved on to secants and tangents and we covered one, I believe we covered two, we covered two of those cases. So we covered the case where the power of secant was even. Um, this is especially useful when it's greater than uh, four, greater than or equal to four. We covered the case when the tangent is odd and secant is present. And I got a question on e an email, which I guess I should probably mention here. What if you're in both of these situations? The secant is even and the power of tangent is odd. Well, you do whichever one is easier. This is kind of like the situation that we were in when we had both uh, sine to the m of x times cosine to the n of x, where both the powers were odd. You pick the smaller one to change and you pretty much follow that same principle here. So if you're in a mixture of case one and case two, you tend to kind of do whichever one causes you less work to actually expand things when you change them. So if the power of the secant is the higher power, it means it's going to be harder to change that guy into tangents. And if the power of the tangent is higher, it's going to be harder to change that guy into secants. So just be aware of that, um, what would actually cause more work. Uh, case three was the most interesting one, of course which basically the steps are, you try some, hope it works out, and if not, you try something else. Um, so secants and tangents in and of themselves start to get more complicated a lot quicker. Um, so with sines and cosines, it's not that bad. We pretty much have a handle on every possible situation you're going to be able to get into with um, whole number powers. And we even looked at some examples where we didn't have whole number powers and we still figured it out. Um, secants and tangents are a little bit more challenging. So uh, I went through one example and someone in the class helped me with this and I left two more for you guys to do. So we are going to be doing those. So the first one is the secant cubed. Let's move this one out of the way. And now we're ready to jump in. So we're back to where we started. 
So maybe someone can help me. How do we do the integral of secant cubed? So I think you'd start by breaking it down into secant times secant squared dx. Yeah. Oh, wait. Well, I don't know because like in this one, you know, like we know the integral of secant and we know the integral of secant squared. So right. is there a way we could do like the product rule and like you do like the tabular method and like what well, the integration version of the product rule as in integration by parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what that's called. Okay. What would the parts be um, Well, I guess they're both trig functions. So it doesn't matter which one is you and which one is DV, but I guess to make it easier for ourselves, you mm -hmm. should probably be um, secant squared and then dv could be secant. So you want the u to be secant squared and the dv to be secant? Uh, yeah, because then like... Okay, so your du would be... Uh, wait. I forget it. Hold on. Can someone help her out? Derivative of secant squared? Wouldn't it be easier if u was secant x and then dv was secant squared x? I don't know, in what sense? Oh, but first of all, let's, let's make sure. Do we know how to differentiate secant squared? Wasn't just- Two secant times derivative secant, which is secant tangent, right? Right, so secant tangent. So you would actually get two secant squared tangent. And your V would be, well, ln of absolute value secant x plus tangent x. Yeah, does that look like how we want to go? I probably not, right? <laughs> that doesn't look the other look way fun. would be better. Um, the other way is probably better. Hey, we okay. tried something. Uh, didn't doesn't seem like it's gonna work out, and I'm not even uh, willing to actually <laughs> go further than this. So the other way around, though, we do know the integral of secant squared, and that's actually something pretty nice, right? The integral of secant squared. So if my dv is secant squared, what's the integral? Tan x. Just tangent, right? Which is nice. It's nicer than ln of secant, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this means my u is going to be just secant. So my du would be secant x tan x. Okay, I don't know where this is going. Okay, okay fine, I do know. I'm just saying that for dramatic effect. But let's, let's actually, we might not know where this is leading, but I definitely prefer this parts uh, as opposed to the one that we just tried. So let's just try some, let's actually run with this. So then this will give us u times v minus the integral of v du. And so now we have that. So now we are focusing on this integral over here. Is that one of the cases that we know how to deal with? So we know how to deal with the power of secant is even, and we know how to deal with the power of tangent is odd. Literally the opposite happens here. Um, so this integral itself is something that you would probably, it's a case three, try something. So what do you think you would try here? I replace tan x, x squared with secant squared minus one. Okay, and then what? And then I distributed the secant to get secant cubed minus secant. Didn't we start with the secant cubed though? We did. So is that we're like kind of back where we started? Yeah, what does that mean? Can we replace that with I? 
Yeah, that does remind us of something we've done before, right? Like when we had those revolving integration by parts, when we did an integration by parts and we got the original back, what we did was we just stopped and then we just thought of that thing as the thing we wanted to solve for, the I, and try to bring it to the other side. So let's actually do that. Let's say I, I call this guy I. What we just noticed is I shows up again. So there's an I on this side. minus i and with this that would be plus the integral of secant when i expand the parentheses so yeah now it's just an algebra problem uh this means that 2i is equal to secant x tangent x plus integral of secant ln absolute value secant plus tangent And so now you just divide by two. So this means your i is equal to one half secant, and let me actually just write this out. This means the integral of secant cubed of x dx is equal to one half secant x tan x plus ln of secant x plus 10x plus c. Uh, professor, where'd the one half come from? I'm sorry, the two. Oh, when I, when I brought this i to that side. So I plus i to both sides. Okay. Okay, so that actually worked out. Shocker. Here, you wanna know something else shocking? Now I'm gonna uh, say something that you might think at the moment is strange, but probably in the future, you're going to realize why um, I'm saying this. This is now a basic rule. know the integral of secant cubed by heart. It actually shows up more often than you would think, all right, right? So if you're ever in a situation where, um, even in future calculus classes uh, and a lot of physics classes, it just so happens that the secant of cubed, for whatever reason, just shows up all the time. Um, it's actually worth knowing it because you wouldn't wanna have to do this whole integration by parts derivation every time you see a secant cubed. Surprisingly, they show up more often than you would think. Uh, secant cubed, I think, is actually something worth memorizing. So for us, this is now a basic rule. Um, yeah. Let's, uh, the other one. Let's see. Yeah, so that's the answer, so. I'll leave this professor page right here. Yeah. So when you look at if the integral of secant q of x equals a half, now secant x tan x is the derivative of secant of x, right? Yes. And then ln of secant x plus tan x is the integral of secant of x. Yes. So the integral of secant cubed is half of the derivative of secant plus the integral of secant. Yeah. Plus C. Yeah, very poetic. Think of it as a coincidence, though. Uh, there, there's no. It's, 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 it's a very poetic coincidence. Let's think of it that way. So there's no like deeper meaning to that. Yeah. If, if that's what you're hinting at. But, but yeah, I think that makes it easier to remember. It, yeah, if that makes it easier for you to remember, you can remember that. That that is correct. Uh, secant tangent is the derivative of secant, and ln of secant plus tangent in absolute values is the integral of secant. Yeah. So it's just half the sum of the derivative of secant and the integral of secant. That is in fact correct. I mean, I don't know if I would 
recommend someone memorizing it that way, but if, if that helps you memorize, Maybe. Yeah. Believe it or not, in all the years that I've taught this class, no one has ever actually said that to me. <laughs> no one has ever said, oh, it's just like uh, it's the sum of these and then you take half of it. Like, no one's ever said that. Like, I. Um, I considered secant, the integral of secant cubed to be a basic rule because I literally went through all these classes where I keep having to integrate secant cubed. So I kind of just memorized it just through sheer force. And um, since then, I've always recommended that my students memorize this formula. Um, but yeah, no one's ever actually said it that way. But that is in fact true. What about secant times tangent squared? So we kind of just like did that, right, for in this one. So we could do like secant x times secant squared plus one. Yeah, so here, we actually worked on this integral. Secant squared x minus one. So this is actually the integral of secant cubed x minus the integral of secant x. And now we actually know how to do both of those, right? So. So we have that. So we now have so it's one half ln of secant x plus tangent x, and then we minus ln of secant x tangent x. So that's just a negative. You can put this in here. Okay, awesome. So here we used our newly found basic rule. Wouldn't the ln secant x plus tangent x cancel out? Uh, no, because the first one is in a set of parentheses and being multiplied by a half. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, so it's plus a half, the ln blah minus ln blah so you end up with negative a half ln blah, and then I just put it, factored out the half again. Okay, so we have that. And I believe that was the last example. Yeah, that was the last example in this section. All right, cool. All right, let's actually jump into the next section. It's gonna be interesting. It is something called da, 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 trig substitution. I have a question. Yes. I noticed that on the homework, some of the questions have cotangents. Um, would you, how would you recommend like starting with those? Yeah, so I don't expect you guys to really know cotangents, but I would just uh, look up the formulas. Consider those problems open book problems. At the end of the day, the principles to deal with cotangents and cosecants are very similar to those to deal with secants and tangents. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but anything you learn from those problems, you don't have to memorize it or anything like that. So that's just the algorithm, just picking random trig functions. Okay. All right. So. How I introduce this topic is actually something that we've actually seen before in this class, where I kind of mentioned to you guys that a lot of, we can actually make our substitutions a little bit more robust than we're used to. So for example, so just to kind of motivate uh, this new topic, 7.3 trig substitution, 
let's look at this example, the integral of x cubed divided by the square root of x squared plus one dx. Let's say we wanted to do that. Here's, um, and I'll spare you the, uh, the headache, and I'll, I'll probably show you, how would a typical How would a typical calc student handle this? Um, so they would probably do something like u equals x squared plus one. Your du would be two x dx. And so you have one half du is equal to x dx. And then they try to apply that substitution. Do you see how we can actually apply that substitution? How would I rewrite the new integral? Are you asking how the calc student would or how we would? <laughs> uh, continue with the line of reasoning that I just set up. How would you get the rewrite the integral now? Uh, it would be <laughs> uh, it'd be a half du cubed. A half du cubed. What do you what do you mean by because, that? Because if du is x, oh. so that's the integral. Hold on. Yeah. So an integral like this, I would agree that substitution is the correct approach. So here I did a substitution. U equals x squared plus one because a principle of substitution is you want to substitute an expression that's going to make your integrand simpler, right? The denominator is actually what's making this complicated. Getting the denominator to be a single variable seems like a good idea. So this is the substitution. How do I now apply it? Would the numerator be u minus one? How would you get that? Because I figure like if x dx is going to be taken out and then x squared's on the top, Mm -hmm. And then u is x squared plus one. I figure maybe you could do u minus one to get x squared. Yeah, you can think of this guy as x squared over this times you factor off an x. And then you realize that this part here, well, that's just your one half du. And so this part here, you know, is your u. And so you're left over with an x squared. What do we do with the x squared? Well, according to this, your x squared is going to be u minus one. And so you can apply that here. I don't know if there, there are too many colors going off on that thing. So yeah, I can think of the x squared as u minus one, and now I can apply that substitution. So this is going to look like the integral of u minus one over the square root of u times one half d, okay? So now you would get one half times integral of u minus one over the square root of u. How you deal with that will, you'd simplify. Uh, so that's the square root of u minus, u to the minus a half. Or let's just write that as u to the half. And you would add one to the power, divide by the new power, add one to the power, divide by the new power plus C. And so this would become right? So that would be the answer. Right? Now that is actually the answer. Um, however, here's a principle that I've actually uh, shown you guys before. However, we can make things easier with a bit more robust substitution. Substitution. Okay. So look back at this integral. Um, based on our few interactions with each other, what do you think that Javon would want you to substitute? Let's 
something that's going to make it even easier. Would you do one over the radical x squared plus one times x squared dx, and then you could do, that's like a, one of the identities, maybe? Uh, no, that, no, that's not an identity, because the x is a problem. Okay. You'll start with a substitution. There's okay. a way that you can make your u work out a little bit nicer here. Would you do u squared? Right, a u squared here? substitution. So instead of just letting u, how about a u squared substitution? Now, what is the benefit of a u squared substitution? Well, it allows us to simplify the integral even more. Um, so in fact, it gets rid of the, the radical u in that denominator, okay? So if I have, let's actually move this guy. So I have the integral of x cubed over the square root of x squared plus one dx. Of course, yes, I can think of that as this. So now I'm thinking, all right, I'm gonna do a substitution. Definitely I'm gonna to wanna to get rid of that x squared plus one because that's making things complicated. And that then my x is gonna be a part of my du. But then I also realized there's also a radical. I could do a little bit better than just the regular u substitution. Let's just do a u squared substitution. Now, if I differentiate both sides, I get my u du is equal to x dx. So with this new substitution, this part here becomes u du. This whole thing here becomes u. And then my x squared becomes, uh, well, u squared minus one. Now, when you plug this into the integral, this is u squared minus one over u times u du. The u's would cancel. And now you only have to worry about this guy, right? Which is a lot nicer than the last integral we had to do, right? Now, the, now the last integral isn't crazy or super difficult by no means, but clearly having to deal with this guy, if you had to choose between dealing with that guy and deal with this guy, I think we'd all choose the second one. Um, so that's a lot easier. And now we plug in the U. Now the u was the square root of the, the thing. So for the u, we're going to plug in the x squared plus one to the one half power. And we have that. So we can actually get to the answer a lot easier, a lot quicker. You'll notice that this is the same answer, right? If I took the one half and multiplied out, I, I would get the same thing. Same answer, less stress, right? So substitution is a very powerful technique, but what I want to motivate you guys, motivate uh, to you right now is that tweaking the kind of substitution you do can actually make your life easier. So just going with a plain vanilla U substitution isn't always the best approach. Um, and here's another example. Consider this example. How would you do this one? Suppose we tried the same approach. It worked out very well last time. Why not try it again? U squared equals X squared plus one. Uh, your two U DU is going to be two X DX. So your U DU is equal to X DX. Now, when you start to go and plug that into the integral, you realize that Now you actually have an x left over, not an x squared. So this part here, that's no problem, that's u du. This part here, that's no problem, that's just u. But this guy here, 
what's that? Well, that would end up being like the square root of u squared minus one. So now you would end up in a situation like the following. You would end up with And this one, well, I shouldn't say it's difficult, but it's difficult for us at the moment, right? Do you know how to integrate the square root of u squared minus one? Not really, right? If it was a one over the square root of u squared minus one, then yeah, I could use a hyperbolic trig function to get to that. But this one is actually difficult. It would, it would be worse with a regular u substitution. So you, you might be thinking here, ah, Javon, maybe you're just getting too fancy. What if we just did the regular u equals x squared plus one, your du would be two x dx. Uh, you have one half du is equal to x dx. Um, you'd realize that you would still end up with something like the square root Because you'd end up with an x. So yeah, you'd have the square root of u minus 1 over the square root of u times 1 half du. Right? Both of these, no bueno, can't work. Right? Uh, at least we don't know enough to do them. Right? So here's an integral that just by tweaking it a little bit, uh, with the x cubed, it was fine. Uh, we tweaked it just a little bit. In fact, I, I knocked the power down, right, to a square. And now that presents uh, a significant challenge. I suggest to you, which is the point of this section, that another kind of substitution would work. Why stop at making a u squared substitution? Let's reach for the stars. Let's get a little bit more fancy. So the idea that I'm going to introduce to you now is the trig substitution. And why would someone come up with this? It's the same kind of reason why someone would come up with a u squared substitution. You choose your substitution, you tweak it in such a way that you can take advantage of the terrain and that you can make things easier in a certain way. So now I am going to suggest to you that we can actually use trig functions to make this guy look easier in some sense, right? Which is crazy, right? Trig functions making things easier, yeah, whatever. Right, but we're gonna see. We can actually do this guy by doing something that's called a trig substitution. So let me uh, kind of move, well, there's a lot of space here, but let me just jump down. Do I wanna, I don't like wasting space. Maybe I should just copy these guys. We are going to use trig identities once more as our motivation for coming up with something And once again, we're going to do a lot more examples because trig substitution is something that you have to do a bunch of examples to get used to. And then I'm going to tell you about how to distinguish between when you should be using a trig sub versus not. Because as you can see with those two examples, the first one, a regular substitution or even a u squared substitution worked fine, but with the second example, no. Okay. So here's what we can do. It turns out that there is a situation in which our trig functions can actually make the scenario that we're faced with a lot easier. What scenario was that? How to deal with the x squared plus one? So why? How to deal with the x squared plus one? It turns out that we have something with trig functions that does remind us of that situation. Let's remind, remember our Pythagorean identities, which of course we do remember here, right? Um, hopefully you know that one minus sine squared is cosine squared. One plus tangent squared is secant squared. Secant squared minus one is tangent squared, okay? What this means is that I, for each of these, what I did was I multiplied both sides of the equation by a squared. You'll see why in a second. So this identity is going to be true. 
a squared minus a sine theta in squared is going to give me a cos a squared cosine squared. Similarly, these will follow. Now, here's the idea. What if I represented the guy that's inside here on the left with a single variable? Let's use a variable to represent that trig function, say x. This means if I think of the left side as something like an a squared minus x squared, then the right side is going to be something that's equivalent to a squared cosine squared, right? It falls directly from this idea right here. Now, why is that useful? Well, if this is something that's under a radical and there are two terms, using this trig function idea, I will now be able to get one term under a radical. And having one term under a radical is a lot nicer than having two terms under a radical. Of course, we know that for sure because we did it here. See, having the single u term under the radical, we can deal with that easy peasy, rewrite it using the laws of exponents, right? Having two terms under the radical, that was hard, that was difficult. What we have hidden in our trig identities is a way to go from a situation where we have two terms to a situation where we only have one term. And that in and of itself is a very useful thing to be able to do, right? So we have all of these identities. In other words, if I'm in a situation like this, where I have a constant squared minus something squared, I can think of that something as if it were a sine function. And I would be able to uh, simplify those two terms into one term, something similar to a cosine function. If I have two terms that looks like a, a, a constant squared plus something, some variable squared, I can think of that variable as a tangent function. That will allow me to collapse the, those sum of terms into something that looks like a secant function. If I have something that looks like a function, some variable, right, which is my trig function here, squared minus a constant squared, I can think of the variable as a secant. And what that does is it collapses this sum into something that looks like a single tangent function, right? So that's the idea that we're going to run with. That suggests a substitution. This suggests whenever I see something like a squared minus x squared, right? Or a squared plus x squared, or x squared minus a squared, I can think of my x in a very specific way. I can think of my x as if it were a trig function. Right? You might notice in this example here, I have x squared plus one. Notice that one is one squared. In other words, this looks like an x squared plus an a squared form, which is covered by the second term in this table. Right? So hopefully you guys are seeing the pattern here. So what does this mean for us? Well, let's, let's actually finish filling out this table. I'm going to fill out this table. Let's suppose I have something that looks like a squared minus x squared. What I can do, a useful substitution would be, think of the x like an a sine theta. Why? Because I know if I have an a squared minus an a squared sine squared theta, I can turn that into one term. So if I think of my x as a sine function, a constant time sine function, specifically the same constant that is the base of the constant term, that's going to allow me to simplify things. Um, I should also mention here, it's, it's rarely used, but x equals cos a cosine theta will work for similar reasons. Or press nine to be removed. So the reason why you don't see people using cosine a lot is because it is a substitution. So eventually you have to differentiate to find the dx. And if you let x equals a cosine, your dx is going to include a negative sign. And for aesthetic reasons, we don't want that. So it's very typical for someone in this situation to substitute a sine function instead of a cosine. But substituting a cosine will actually work just as well. Um, except you have to worry about negative signs once you're differentiating. Now, what does that mean? This would mean, for example, if my x is equal to a sine theta, this means that x over a, I can think of that as sine theta. And so this leads to a triangle, where x is the opposite, a hypotenuse is the adjacent, the hypotenuse is a, and the adjacent by Pythagoras' theorem 
would be a squared minus x squared, which is actually, you'll see this term pop up right back again, right? That's going to be very useful later, right? Similarly, if I see something like uh, a squared plus x squared, I can think of that as something like an a squared, a, con a one plus tangent squared, which I can collapse into a secant squared, right? So I can do that here, and that would lead to this triangle, right? X over A would be tangent. So I can create this triangle. This is opposite over adjacent. So this would actually be the A squared plus X squared by Pythagoras' theorem. Similarly over here, this says my X over A is secant. So this leads us to a triangle where the, this is hypotenuse over adjacent because it's one over cosine. So this would be uh, the x squared minus a squared. Now this part in the table, it's useful for, for back substitution. And we'll see how later on. Right, so what is back substitution? Back substitution is when we get to an answer, back substitution is what we do here. When we get to an answer in U and we resubstitute to the original variable, this is called a back substitution. Um, it's i.e. it's substituting back in the original variable. It turns out that once you make your substitution a trig function, plugging back in the original variable is something that has challenges. Because if you have random trig functions all over the place, you will need a way to change them so that you can swap out uh, with your original substitution. And because it's a trig function, Sokotoa is actually super useful for that. So knowing the triangle is actually going to be very important. Um, and it turns out by doing this, by performing this substitution, uh, it can make our lives easier. The above substitutions may work if we have expressions like these. in our integrand. And because we always think of substitution as a third thing, uh, substitution won't work, as was in the last motivating example. Professor? Yes. When you're doing these kinds of problems, um, let's say that it's like x squared minus 16, so then mm -hmm. x would equal four secant theta? Yes. Okay, just making sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so the constant, you think of the constant as a square, so it's a squared, and your x is going to be the a times secant theta, so yes. Gotcha, thank you. You always want to think of your constant as a square, whatever it is. And that allows you to take advantage of these uh, ideas. So um, the first one, I'm going to actually go through that uh, and just explain to you guys how, it, how it's going to be done. And then you guys are going to help me with the rest, right? So let me just move these to the side. And whatever we don't finish today, I'll leave that for you next time. So we should finish this topic up next time. OK, so yes, they're over there. Okay, so let me show you how how would you, how would we apply what I have in that table. So here I look at this thing. Okay, now always, always, always I do go through that strategy. So one basic rule: 
No. Two, can I simplify to get a basic rule? No. Three, substitution? No, right? And why no uh, compared to the x squared over the square root of x squared plus one dx example? You can get a substitution to work on this one for pretty much the same reason that you couldn't get a substitution to work on that one. Um, but I'll, 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 make, I'll make that more precise towards the end. At some point, I'm going to uh, tell you how you would know that the substitution is not going to work. So you'd want to try something like a trick substitution. Um, because almost always, pretty much always, I can't even think of an example where it's not the case, getting a trick substitution to work out is going to be harder than getting a regular U substitution to work out. So you don't really want to do a trick substitution unless you really have to. And that's going to be for various reasons and we'll see. And that's because the back substitution phase is actually as well hard. Okay, so four, and again, all the steps I'm think, thinking here don't come in any particular order. But here, what I would notice, the four minus x squared. Years of mathematical training would tell me, I can think of that as two squared minus x squared. That looks like an a squared minus x squared. So I went through my regular strategy, nothing seems to work out. However, I noticed that there's a certain pattern here. There is something in this integral that looks like an a squared minus x squared. So I have this table memorized, right? And I know whenever I see an a squared minus x squared, letting x be some a constant times sign is going to be a very useful substitution. What constant times sign? Well, a times sign, where a is the base. If I write the constant as a square, a is going to be the base. So notice here is that my a is two. So what I'm going to do here is a trig substitution. It's called trig substitution because we're substituting a trig function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let x be 2 sine theta, OK? How would we continue? Well, we have to find dx. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug into the original integral. And it's this guy. Is it? Yes, good. OK, so I'm just going to go and I'm going to plug these guys in. So this is going to be equal to x squared. Well, that's 4 sine squared theta in the denominator. I would have 4 minus 4 sine squared theta times my dx is 2 cosine theta d theta. So this part here is my dx. And this part here is, of course, x squared. This part here is, of course, x squared. So now I go from this, this integral to an integral with only trig functions. Now, at first, this does look scary. However, we just did an entire section on trig integrals. So I'm hoping, because there are only sines and cosines here, it's actually going to be easy. Someone just dropped out of the class. Let me put them back in. It's actually going to be easier for me to actually deal with this integral. And in fact, remember, the whole reason why I substituted the x equals this thing is so that the two terms in the denominator can collapse into one term. What you will notice is going to happen is that you can factor out a four 
which leaves you with a one minus cosine squared. And one minus cosine squared is sine squared. Uh, professor? One minus sine squared, sorry. Okay. And so that would give you cosine squared. Now what's going to happen? That just becomes two cosine theta in the denominator. Of course, we're going to ignore the absolute value thing. We don't have to worry about that right here. And look at that. Now they cancel. So now it becomes this integral. Now, the more you do this, uh, you will be able to actually skip a lot of steps here. Um, if you find you have to, if you keep making mistakes, sure, you can go through all of this. But in general, um, with some practice, students are usually able to skip to this step. Right? So here I was working it out for you to see it. But remember in our table, we automatically know that the expression that looks like one, it's going to, the expression is going to turn into an a squared cosine squared, right? You'll notice here that that's exactly what happened here. The denominator became an a squared cosine squared. It became the two squared times cosine squared. So you can actually know that that's where it's going to end up. So you didn't have to actually do this and factor out the four and then use the Pythagorean identity. Uh, you, with practice, you'll know that that denominator would automatically jump here, but I digress. Okay, but eventually we are here. How do we integrate sine squared? Well, isn't this from yes last time? The sure. sine power is even and the cosine power is also even. Yeah, what do we do? So reserve a, oh, this is the even even, so a double angle. Okay, what's the double angle for sine? Uh, one my, one half times one minus cosine of two theta. Right, so this becomes that which we can integrate and get that. Now, this is the answer. However, the answer is in thetas. Um, we prefer an answer in x. Let's not say prefer. I don't want you to think of it as an option. Uh, we'd like an answer next. We require an answer next. Right? The original problem was a, a problem in dx, right? I need to tell you the answer at x. This is where the back substitution happens. Now, how do we do the back substitution? This is where the triangle comes in. So remember, if we look back at that table where I told you uh, being able to draw these triangles is going to be useful. How is that triangle uh, going to be useful? Well, uh, let me just actually show you. So our substitution was x is equal to 2 sine theta. So this means that x over 2 is equal to sine theta. So this actually means, because of Sokotoa, this is opposite over hypotenuse. So this here is going to be the square root of four minus x squared. From this, I would know, for example, that the cosine theta is 
adjacent over hypotenuse. I would also be able to figure out the tan, the secant. I'd be able to figure out anything else in terms of x's. However, in this case, these guys aren't necessary, right? The thing I want to change is this expression. I need to be able to rewrite sine two theta as x's, right? Now, I know that my sine theta is just x over two, so I can literally replace a sine function with the expression x over two. I can replace a cosine expression with radical of four minus x squared over two, right? The other trick functions I don't actually need to know. Right, so don't need. I guess cotangent would be something else we don't need. Okay. So that being said, now that I know what sine and cosine are, can I actually rewrite this answer? So I equals Okay, ideas on how I would actually get this to work? I have an idea. Yeah? So we, we if you scroll above, we would use the uh, x over two equals sine theta and mm -hmm. solve for theta. So we, t we take the inverse sine. Okay. To say that theta equals the inverse sine of x over two. Right, so that's this one? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. What about the second term? It would be sine of two inverse sine of x over two. Okay, how or, would you do that? Isn't there a rule, is there a rule for taking the sine of an inverse sine? There is, but you don't have sine of an inverse sine. You have sine of two times an inverse. So there's another form that you should be uh, thinking about first. Oh, and I just saw a question in the chat. How do you know it's the square root of four minus it? Oh, someone else answered. Yes, Pythagoras' theorem. Probably someone was asking me, how do I know this? Yeah, I use Pythagoras' theorem. I know that this squared is equal to that squared plus that squared. So, yeah. Sine of two theta. What do you think about when you think sine of two theta? Oh, it's a double angle. It's a double angle formula. What's the formula for it? Is that the same as? Yeah, go. Um, is it two times sine cosine? Two sine theta cosine theta. That's the double angle formula for this guy. Now, I know the sine and I know the cosine. The sine is x over two. The cosine is the square root of four minus x squared over two, right? We found that from the triangle above. So now I can actually just plug those guys in. So this is going to be two times sine inverse of x over two. Let me write it different. So this is two times theta minus the twos cancel. So this is just sine theta times cosine theta. And now I substitute these guys in. So this is two times sine inverse of x over two minus 
um, x times the square root of four minus x squared over four. So that's the actual answer. So a sine inverse was it hidden in the integrand here. So no wonder we couldn't do that earlier example. Okay, so just to recap this example, we have this integral of x squared over the radical of four minus x squared dx. Because I, I know I should always go through the integration strategy, first thing I think, is this a basic rule? No, can I simplify to be a basic rule? Will a substitution work? Now, you probably won't see why a substitution won't work right away, but by the end of this section, you will. Um, but ultimately, you're going to decide on no, the substitution isn't going to work out for me here. So now you start to see what else can we do? Integration by parts, what would the parts be? It's very complicated. However, you realize that there's an expression for minus x squared. Oh, that's a constant minus x squared. I can think of that as some constant squared minus x squared. And so uh, now I start thinking about the sine function, right? Why? Because I know this table and I now know the technique called trig substitution. So this is something I would think. Going in with x equals a sine theta, where my a in this case is two, that tells me that's my dx. And when I plug it into this integral, I can simplify it into another trick, into some trig function. So ultimately I go from a situation that was very difficult to deal with in x's. I moved it to the universe that the theta universe, and it's now an integral that I can deal with easier. So I can just integrate that based on the last section where I taught you how to integrate trig functions. The problem is now we have the answer in the variable theta. We need to transfer it late back to the x universe. However, it's not just something where you can just plug in thetas, x's for thetas and let, let it go. Um, you have to go through a whole back substitution process. This is one of the reasons why um, trig substitution is probably going to be one of the more annoying techniques that we're going to learn. So it's going to be something that you're going to need to know when you should or shouldn't use it. You don't want to use it when you don't have to because it's hard to actually get to the answer back in the original variable. Not hard, but a little bit annoying. However, um, it is straightforward, more or less. It's just you constructing a triangle and doing Pythagoras' theorem. Using Sokotoa to create the triangle, doing Pythagoras' theorem. Figure out the individual trig functions, and then use those individual trig functions to swap out the trig functions in your answer. And ultimately, now we get an answer. So that is actually the integral of squared over the radical of four minus x squared. Professor. That is trig substitution, yes. Can you just go over quickly one more time how you got uh, the arc sine x over two? Oh, because my x was two sine theta. So I can solve for the sine is x over two. And then I just take sine inverse of both sides. Oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Because sine inverse of sine is just theta. It, it cancels it. OK. So that was trick sub. Whew. All right. Now we're going to do a bunch more examples. Let's look at this one. Now this one, this one is something that you should have memorized. At least, I don't know. When I taught Calc 1, I had them memorize it. You might, I don't know. It depends on where you came from. Does anyone know what this is? Tan inverse. Right, it's tangent inverse. Right, this is, this is in fact a basic rule. Um, it was derived in Calc 1. Uh, but as just, just an, an easy example to start off with, I would like you guys to re-derive this rule using trig substitution. So in Calc 1, you basically figured this out because you learned how to differentiate inverse functions and you found that the derivative of tan inverse is one over one plus x squared. So you know that the integral of one over x squared is it. But here, let's do it directly from the integration side. Let's actually work out the fact that it actually will give us a tan inverse. You can actually do this using trig substitution. So 
So in Calc 1, you derived in Calc 1 using the fact that you know that the derivative of an inverse function is 1 over f prime times evaluate at the inverse function. Right, so you could use that and derive this formal. But let's say now we actually forgot that hell froze over or something. All right, so based on what we have been discussing, how do you think we would approach this? So first of all, the answer to is it a basic rule is yes. It is something that I expect you to remember. But let's say we skip that. Can I simplify this? Not really. Would a regular substitution work? Not really. I mean, if you let u equals one plus x squared, your du is gonna be two x dx. Where are you gonna get that x from? Um, right? Um, you can multiply and divide by an x, but then that x that you would now have to place in the denominator, that would become the square root of u minus one in the denominator. That's actually more annoying. You'll realize that a substitution isn't going to work out. So now, how would you proceed with a trig substitution? What would be the correct trig substitution in this scenario? Did you guys um, get the table? Let me scroll back up here to the table. So you should probably take a picture of that. I'll give you like five seconds. Take a screenshot or whatever. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So based on that table, what do you think the appropriate uh, trig substitution is? Well, the one plus x squared looks like the a squared plus x squared. Mm -hmm. So then x would be just tan theta. Right, a tan theta. So it's just tan theta. And so then, dx would be secant squared. And so now I go and I plug that in. So this is one over one plus tangent squared because my x is tangent. My dx would be secant squared. What you're going to notice is that the denominator now collapses into a single term. And like I said, you could skip to here. So now what you'll realize is uh, the secant squares cancel. You end up with the integral of one d theta, which is integral of one d theta. Theta plus c. Theta plus c. Now, since my x was tan theta, that means my theta is tan inverse of x. There you go. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So if it wasn't indeterminate and they gave us uh, bounds for finding the integral, yes. would we have to um, back? Uh, no. Was it? We could just, as long as we plug in those bounds. Uh, yeah, I have an example like that here, example G. You would remember when you did uh, definite integrals back in Calc 1, you had an option, right? You could either leave the old bounds, change back to the old variable and plug those bounds in, or you could actually change the bounds themselves based on your substitution. And then when you get the answer in use, you could plug those numbers directly into use. You remember? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the recommendation for trig substitution is always change the bounds and plug them in. Don't do the back yeah. substitution. Okay. Um, but yeah, that, that, that is something that's going to come up later. I have that in an example here. Then we can just get through one more example. And like always, I'll leave the list of the others in the PDF so you guys can work on it and we'll uh, kill those guys in the next class. Okay, this one, someone tell me what to do. It's not a basic rule. Can't simplify it to be a basic rule. Substitution isn't gonna work. Okay, now go. 
trig substitution. Trig substitution. What is the substitution? X would equal A secant theta. Okay, what's A? A is three. No. A is square root of three. A is the square root of three. Right. So remember, you want to think of the constant as an A squared. All right, so that is how you'd start this off. Differentiate derivative of secant to secant tangent. And now you go and you plug that in. So here your i is the integral of one over x squared, that's three secant squared theta times the radical. What's going to happen in here is we're going to have three tangent squared theta, because I, I would have three secant squared theta minus three, factor off the three, I would left with secant squared minus one, secant squared minus one becomes tangent. Then here I have radical of secant theta tan theta d theta. So this actually cancels radical three that, and this cancels one of those secants. So this becomes one third times the integral of one over secant theta d theta. How do we integrate one over secant? One over secant is tangent. Uh, one over secant isn't tangent. What do you mean? Oh, never mind. How do you integrate one over? Sign? Huh? Come again? Isn't it, isn't it cosine theta? Right. That's just a fancy way of writing cosine theta. Integral of cosine theta is sine theta. So that's the answer, but that's the answer in thetas. I need the answer in x's. So I go back to my original, x equals radical 3 secant theta. So I have to do that whole back substitution. Uh, since x equals radical three secant theta, this means that x over radical three equals secant theta. This means I have this triangle. So this would actually mean radical three over x would be cosine because secant is one over cosine. And so that is adjacent over hypotenuse. So this is the square root of the hypotenuse squared minus the adjacent squared. So this would tell me that my sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse. So that is x squared minus three all over x. And so I would go back here and plug that in. Questions? Can you just scroll up a little? Thank you. Are we getting it? Yeah. We end at six forty five, right? So I think we're done. Uh, so try these for next time. So your quiz tomorrow will include trig substitution. So you might want to practice these for, to, for tomorrow as well. But I'll, I'll leave them here. So next time I'll run through these examples with you guys, or you guys will run through these examples with me the other way around. Um, and also think about this question. How do you know when to do a trig sub versus when not to do a trig sub? Um, because it uh, can make a difference. But yeah. 
I think we'll stop there. Thank you. Okay. Thank so, you. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. Have a good night. Um, we'll stop there. And okay. Yeah, that was it. Hopefully that was fine. Uh, do some more practice. Go over the lecture when I post it tonight and the notes. Try the problems and let me know what you think. Uh, that being said, I will let you guys go. Uh, ciao. See you in the next one.